Okay, so hello everyone, um, and welcome to the Design Plus Health, the Open City Paradigm Roundtable and Exhibition live running here from Venice, Italy. It is organized by the New York Institute of Technology, School of Architecture and Design, and led by Dean Maria Pavellini, and in collaboration with the curator, Alessandro Melis and his team of the Italian Pavilion at the 17th Biennale di Architettura di Venezia in 2021. So thank you all for joining here. And we are live here, as I said, in the Italian Pavilion. You hear maybe a bit of the background noise and uh, I'm sorry for that. Uh, we are here at the 17th Biennale di Architettura di Venezia. And we are in the space of the resilient communities and the Petroli Center. So um, the vision of the Specialist Center, just to give you the theme, is towards the possibility of a new Italian charter for resilient communities. And, for, and uh, direct in this light uh, today, we have invited panelists and uh, we talk about Design Plus Health. A few words to myself, I'm Christian Pongratz. I'm a professor of architecture at New York Institute of Technology and I'm a faculty in the Math of Science specialization, health and design. And I'm your co-host today, together with Chris Lower, who will uh, uh, talk to you in a moment. And uh, yeah, let's get started here. Um, I brought three uh, slides to you, just to get us a bit warmed up before we get our big panelists here, um, giving their presentations. And so first I wanna briefly speak to uh, silos, networks and systems. So uh, at New York Institute of Technology, the School of Architecture, uh, my work investigates systems of urban resilience and the new design plus health platform that we are developing that should engage communities. And we work with the College it's, it's of all all Medicine and the School of Business. And also we integrate emerging industries from VR to robotic automation. In particular, it's in my role as senior advisor to the provost and also as interim dean of the School of Interdisciplinary Studies and Education uh, at New York Institute of Technology. It was always my idea to build bridges. You know? And so, what it, does it mean in education? It means we got to move from silos to systems, in my opinion. And my goal is really to uncover and rethink all of our current practices in design and in the health field. And the question is really, how can we find a unifying perspective and surface those ideas that help us in, in our discipline spanning engagement and approaches? You know? And in that sense, what you see here is uh, on the left, our, our, a diagram on silos. That's how we typically work at universities, right? Every knowledge is somewhere in its own compartment. And it's very difficult to actually communicate to each other because we're also specialized. And very recently, um, those ideas of networking, of course, emerge in all, in all fields. We talk about collaborations and a more divergent uh, way of thinking, but I believe um, it is probably more valid to say we need to talk about systems again, and in which sense we become hopefully more scalable and hopefully also more associative in our thinking. And then another topic that is very dear to my heart um, is really the question of circularity of circular design. Why do we talk today about health and design? Yeah, it is really that we all know, right? That cities across the globe are confronted with an increasingly difficult and interdependent complex urban system and problems and challenges. And we can go from global warming and disaster mitigation, right? To addressing energy and, and also an increasingly food scarcity. And our panelists will speak more to those topics in a moment. And we all know that those problems really exceed the abilities of any one discipline. And that already leads us already to the point we gotta to work together. And we're gonna help also in particular in the transformation of our food systems. Uh -huh. It is in particular the local cultures that are embedded yeah, in the food ecosystem and driven by the very need of course to eat and, and both provide employment. Yeah? But we also impact land, we impact water and other resources that are all invested in the production of our food systems. And right there, I think, lies the opportunity for designers and architects to experiment with creative interventions and using a systems approach. 
Now today we are here in Venice and you can feel in your daily practice as we are doing here, that living on a small <laughs> eco footprint, that's what Venice really is, uh, um, what it looks like. It reminds me a bit to this famous book from Richard Rogers. I think it was published in the 90s. It's talked about um, cities on a, on a really for a small planet. And that's kind of what Venice in, in a certain sense really is. And he talked uh, at that time about the distance, right? How do we walk in five minutes? And how, where do we walk in 15 minutes? And can we have in that range really everything that we need to live, right? So this is more today true than ever. And what you see here is, is this diagram uh, has been developed a while ago by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And I like this in particular because it has been reinterpreted by IDEO, as you know, um, the leading firm about design thinking. And it talks about circularity in a particular sense, right? So here we see on the right side, the kind of technological streams that are intended. So how do we kind of reuse, recycle? And on the left side, your screen, you see the biological cycles. And, and, and the underlying idea is really, if you want to take it with a quote by maybe Will and McDonough, the history of the first industrial revolution would be seen simply as a very linear phase, right? We take, we make, and we waste. Uh, and it led to what we all see as the problems today. Instead, the circular economy, much more interesting on the other hand, and also very, very contemporary is a very ancient idea you know, which is to take and you uh, make something, you reuse it, you kind of redesign it. That's where all the creativity comes in. Yeah, and you make again and so on. So it becomes really a circular approach in all our daily habits. Yeah, and I think this is really what is important, I think, um, for us, both in our teaching with the students and in all our projects that we want to move forward. And I want to conclude with one more slide. Um, that I use often for myself to understand um, kind of the ecosystem in a larger sense, right? So we talk, talk about the open city term it has been defined by the Institute for the Future. And it is really what we need here is to become familiar, all of us on the one hand with what is design thinking. So a much broader distributed approach of how we become creative and we operate. Yeah? And in this sense, we can hopefully understand what the system relationships are and how do we all, um, all of us at one point, hopefully turn in what I will call generalists because we have a fairly broad understanding of the various parts of the system, but in particular, the relationships, not so much the parts. Yeah? And in this kind of new paradigm, it would be great also to develop together a kind of a vision of leaving this industrial system of the past of production behind us and move to a more locally production and locally personalized production that we all can sustain. It affords also that all of us we turn kind of bit by bit yeah, into technologists. And so kind of to sum it up in a sense, um, if we design globally and we build locally in a very broad sense, yeah, it is then what we call a sustainable maker mantra that hopefully ties into this concept I just presented before the circular thinking or the circular economy. And as we all know, it appears that if we all learn one thing from this past year, what we call the annus horribilis, let's say, right? It is the spirit of the novice. Yeah? So, uh, which has been recently argued also in the Wall Street Journal article, very interesting, it was in January, I believe, that the pandemic turned us all really into beginners. And we, <laughs> we have to think about no more do the, way, the, uh, the things as we did them before, but just all of us, we start from zero, right? And this is, I think, the approach where we have today um, really great speakers here that will tie into that kind of uh, practice of, of, of rethinking and redoing and reusing in, in a very complete new way. And with that uh, brief introduction from my side, I want to now bring in my co-host, uh, Chris Lower, who is in the United Kingdom. And he will go a bit deeper, um, particularly on the project we want to present to you um, of students uh, that work with us in the Delta in Arkansas, and also give a bit more of a theoretical background that is our kind of what we call the health ecosystem uh, design approach. Okay, Chris, why don't you uh, take it from here? I stop my share and then we let you get into this. 
So uh, thanks uh, so much, Christian. A real pleasure to be here joining everyone today. Good afternoon, good morning, where, wherever you are, maybe good evening too. Uh, as Christian said, I'm here in the U UK. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it to Italy because of the quarantine restrictions, feeling rather trapped on this uh, island. But as um, Christian says, um, we had a great uh, semester working together on the pilot program, the Health Plus Design Open Studio. And what I'd like to do in sort of the next 10 minutes is really set out the, some of the foundational concepts of my framework, what I call Health Ecosystem Value Design, or HEVD, the main sort of method deployed in the studio at NYIT this spring semester. Also, I want to briefly propose then how the framework informs, I think, the method and task of transdisciplinary urban design with health. So I think the first important concept uh, in the framework is, is actually how it defines uh, health and how, to, how it defines health. So although sort of wholly incorporated, it's not a framework that's just for health care, uh, for, the, for the design, the innovation and organization of healthcare and healthcare systems. Rather, it's a framework for the transdisciplinary creation of health with health defined really in its widest sense as a power for acting, a power for accessing, creating and sustaining a desired valued life or lived experience. So in this sort of wide and normative reframing of health, we move far beyond a more narrow bodily baseline functioning and resource for living definition of health. Instead, we see health as a capacity for accessing and acquiring what are, what are known as affects, sensations, feeling states of positive lived experience that are constituted by 10 relational elements of what I call social desire. And as uh, we can see in the model here, these elements include a full expected life duration, bodily vitality, bodily integrity, a creativity, a sense of belonging and attachment, a human connection, a connection with nature, uh, and the ability to play and, and, and uh, experience and have fun in life. All of the elements adapted from Martha Nussbaum's 10 central capabilities in her book, Creating Capabilities, and this sort of view that's used a lot in sort of development work uh, throughout the world. So with health defined widely as this sort of affective capacity for living well, the framework helps us to address three difficult and usually neglected questions in the empirical health and life sciences. These concern the question of how do lived experiences with health originate or form, especially for chronic diseases such as chronic pain and obesity, res respiratory and cardiac disease, as well as more social diseases, such as the experience of abuse and violence, the experience of neglect, of exploitation, injustice, inequity and inequality. Second, for any given focal context such as these, it also asks questions about how, of how do lived experiences with health disease become different? How do they emerge over a duration of experience they're becoming? And third, it explores how and why do certain experiences, particularly negative experiences, persist and become concentrated in types of individuals and social groups, in communities, in neighborhoods, and in, in sort of our concern in particular in urban design, in places and certain spaces. By addressing all these questions, we be, can then begin to discover the means to design differently and how to sort of proceed from here differently. And to address them then, the sort of third core foundation of the framework is that it deploys an interactional and an active model of, of human experience and human agency. It views the human as an interactional agential being whose lived experience is actualized from interactions with other humans and also with material entities that also have agency in these four registers or affective domains as shown in this dynamic moving model. So these four domains are at the bottom there, bodily motor, the sort of organic register of interactions within the body, 
with what we put into the body, food, drink, and drugs usually, and its motor or mo movement interactions. This domain, this registers the usual focus of the physical health care disciplines. We also have uh, the social cultural domain, the register of interactions with other persons, with groups within and between, with and in uh, organizations. And on the right there, we have a domain of material spatial interactions, uh, interactions with objects, with technologies, with buildings and other material forms, as well as interactions in and through our built and natural environments pertinent to our particular context today. And finally, at the top, we have this sort of perceptual cognitive register of sense making, perception and meaning making of interactions in the other three registers. So through diverse interactions with both human and non-human entities in these four registers, people's lived experiences, our lived experiences become actualized and variously stuck or stabilized via transitions in the affects, sensations, impressions, feeling states, as I mentioned, and their various qualities, content and expression, and also the different affective capacities we have to harness desired or repel undesired affects. So moving quickly through the core concepts, a fourth core concept in the framework is that a movement beyond static empirical methods for seeing, identifying, categorizing and representing experience. Methods usually represented in maps via social deep demographic economic categories, via kind of common identities of different groups, via quantitative data abstractions and via emotion-based expressions of experience. Avoiding then an exclusive kind of analytical empirical tendency, the framework identifies a virtual real domain of what, what of pre-experienced affects, of pre-individual capacities and tendencies that kind of serve as the originating generative mechanisms of lived experience with health and disease and also of their differentiation. So to support this sort of the transdisciplinary design task, the UMIO framework then distinguishes nine interactional flows in this sort of virtual yet real field. Each flow bearing certain types of natural, man-made and human social entities bearing potential affects and potential affective capacities. And these include the material artifactual entities such as buildings and other designed elements in the built environment. So translating this conceptualization of a virtual field and incorporating another foundation in the framework of six tendential forces that influence them, we can now see how any place, whether urban or rural, here pinpointing the Arkansas Delta on earth, how any place already contains certain predominant pre-experienced intensities, qualities, and relations of affects, capacities, uh, and their tendencies. A virtual real view of experience formation that helps us to see the more hidden and often the negative pre-experienced affects and those stuck tendencies that are present in poor neighborhoods, in uh, poor communities, and which via ongoing interactions produce experiences of disease, often over generations. It helps us to see especially the forces of negative affects and tendencies of hopelessness, of despair, of exclusion, that, that diminish the potential capacity for realizing that social desire in health whether for a place and for the people who live there. So with this view, for any focal context of lived experience, we can frame a virtual field or what I call a focal experience ecosystem for any given place, such as a small town in the Arkansas Delta as the students did uh, in, in the course. And doing so helps us to see who are the affectees of this experience the people, groups, communities are affected, and also what I call the affectors, the non-human environmental and material elements, 
as well as the human ideas, tendencies and actors having positive or negative influence or neutral influence on, on a focal context of experience. And with this model now, critically, our lens on lived experience transcends disciplinary separations of learning, design and action, which are themselves products of tendencies of observation of method and targets of creation. And thus, through this way of seeing, we see the open city design and health task as stated here. The transdisciplinary design of ideas, interactions, flows, spaces, and material forms, all bearing potential capacities for individuals, communities, and places to access and sustain health as social desire forming positive lived experience. So to summarize, these are the four core concepts of health ecosystem value design that we applied in our design plus health course this spring semester. A very wide, the widest arguably definition of health beyond care as potential capacities of social desire. Second, a focus on questions of the origin, differentiation and persistence of lived experiences with health and particularly disease and illness. Third is perspective of the human as entangled in interactional flows of multi-agency. And fourth, a framing of the learning and design purpose within this sort of virtual real field or experience ecosystem for a focal context of experience and usually defined by a particular geography or place. So following the health ecosystem value design method and using the pre-built templates, which you can download from the email website, our students' journey was as follows. First, select and research a small town or city in the Arkansas Delta. Define a focal context of lived experience, usually a ne of negative lived experience, and then frame the project and purpose. Second, map the affects characterizing positive and negative poles of capacities for that selected focal context. Then third, map the virtual field, the experience ecosystem of human and non-human effectors influencing the ongoing production of the focal lived experience in that place. Fourth, and a really critical step, is to then step back and reflect on your own and others' tendencies or disciplinary tendencies of perspective, method, design, and creation and action. And then, uh, following from that reflection, design the desired transitions in lived experience for targeted affectees. And only at that point undertake the actual design work, the architectural urban or spatial project design activity, having gone through these earlier uh, steps in the flow of the process. So very briefly, these are the four uh, focal experience context that the four project groups of the students uh, selected. And not uh, by luck rather than by design, each has a particular focus in one of those four registers of effective domains of experience. i will show you the video of the group uh, that undertook, uh, that studied social stigma of persons accessing food bank. There are three groups at the bottom there, they studied motor and movement disability, including hidden disabilities, inhibiting access to foods. So this was in relation to food security, insecurity, but defined in a very wide sense in terms of sort of negative interactions with, with foods. The top one was a very interesting one around the perception of time, the experience of time in place and the ennui or boredom from the repetitiveness in that experience duration of time. One of the students groups focused on that. And the last one was concerning a sense of exclusion, of spatial exclusion in particular, or non-belonging of young women, young mothers, in, in a particular town in the Arkansas Delta. So let's see the design outputs of the group, as I mentioned, exploring social stigma uh, in a video presented by students Naomi Kodo, Becky Lung and Katie Trainer. So let me, I can flip uh, Christian to play this. Full screen. Okay.
Chris, do you want to check if it's running? Um, I see the one slide and the audio. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Chris, can, can, can you not hear? I can hear you. Um, I saw the video starting. Hmm. Just wanted to make sure that we hear the audio and it's running. Uh, okay, right. Let me just reload it uh, again. We see now just the image of you. Yeah. Do you want to try it from your end then? Because there might be just, uh, if you've got it set up, just grab it back and press play. Hi, my team consists of Naomi Kahn, Becky Wong, and Katie Trainer. We just finished our 2021 spring semester in our community focused design studio, guided by Christian Pongratz, Professor of Architecture at NYT, and Chris Horner, adjunct clinical instructor at the College of Osteopathic Medicine at NYT. This semester, we focused on design research in the Arkansas Delta community. Looking through the lens of outfit food and security, we aim to change the lived experience of people in Arkansas. Um, so as a teenager, I would volunteer at the local facility for my church, and that we were not allowed in the front of the building where the persons receiving bags of food were. The people who ran the pantry didn't want us to see the kids who might be coming in from our school because their families are unable to provide for them. Christian, you need to unmute so we can hear the video. Taking him up from the daycare and then going to the grocery store the next night or after to get the rest of the things necessary. She felt ashamed and tried her best not to let him know that they were actually poor. So in the widest sense, stigma is the fear of interaction, interacting with other persons, having a negative experience by exposure, visibility, or direct interaction with other persons. Uh, stigma by definition is a mark or disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. In a non-medical sense around mental illness, in a broad view, it is the fear of social interaction. So there's four um, main forms of stigma. So the one attached to identification, so race, ethnicity, religion, or ideology. The one uh, associated with physical deformation, so that could be obesity, body image, or gender, and then stigma associated with mental illness, depression, anxiety, eating disorder, or the stigma associated with space. So in this case, food banks and gyms and grocery stores. Okay, so this diagram focuses on the lived experience, lived experience of persons who are stigmatized by having a poor relationship with food. We expand on the social and health sectors to understand how we can change their lived experience. The relationship with food could have come about by trauma, social stigmas, inaccessibility, et cetera. These factors affect the person stigmatized by having low self-esteem or feeling shame and guilt. These persons can be someone with mental illness, unemployed, someone with, without access to transportation, someone experienced poverty, disabled or ill, a student, someone who's homeless, someone who's underpaid, someone affected by COVID-19, et cetera. All of these people are existing in smack over Arkansas. The negative effects that you can see on the left in the red 
um, affect the lived experience in a negative way. Um, it's the limited access to healthy food. For example, people can be malnutrition, obese, purchasing of cheap junk food, as well as carrying the shame of going to a food bank, which can result in a limited access to interactions. The negative effectors could be healthcare, mental health services, government, food banks, lunchtime at schools or work, etc. Now the positive side, the blue side on the right, um, being ideally the easily accessible, healthy food sources could begin to shape a new lived experience for those stigmatized. To be able to receive fresh produce, which is not accessible in the food banks, the creation of cross-programming to learn and socialize, and the development of community to change the lived experience of someone uh, stigmatized. So the main question we asked ourselves, ourselves was, how do we use the problem of stigma to change the lived experience of those with a poor relationship to food? The lack of connection and infrastructure makes it difficult for the surrounding individuals to have accessibility to others and the facilities necessary to thrive. The narrative behind our design strategy is to create flexible spaces that reconnect people with the community while simultaneously offering readily available new programs for those in need. Our narrative throughout the semester was to reduce stigma through food accessibility and experience and the process of cross programming to create the space <clears throat> to learn and be become excited. This strategy will change the lived experience of those stigmatized, which will begin to reduce the stigma around them. Our town is Snarkover, which is a relatively small town in Union County, and it has a population of 1,688 as of 2019. Um, we noticed that it only has a few places where local can get food. Um, notably the donut shop where um, kids go after school or a food bank, but it's only available on the first Tuesdays and Thursdays of the month. The rest are little convenience stores or little restaurants that serve, they do serve meals, but they would not sustain family throughout the week. Families um, usually have to drive out of neighbor out of town to neighboring towns like um, Norflet or El Dorado to access bigger supermarkets like Walmart. And from there, um, we dive in food insecurity, which is defined as the state of being without reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable, nutritious food. And in the diagram above, we see the cycle that food insecurity creates. Um, starting with the lack of nutritious food, going into poor disease management, which then results in the increase of health complications, and then medical care and medications, which leads to increased expenses, and it um, results in less money for nutritious food and the cycle keeps going. In order to reduce stigma, we came to the conclusion that we need to change the experience. To change lived experience, we want to promote the idea of community, inclusivity, and social connectedness motivated by health, learning, and knowledge. This diagram shows the four main goals of changing the lived experience. Building a community for Smackover is important. Looking from the outside, they don't have much of a community. We wanted to implement learning to engage people of all ages, gender, race, etc activity, whether it's painting, pottery, sports, group exercise, basically any activity that engages everyone in some way to become socially connected, and wellness to provide help and balance to those struggling with mental illness or disorders. Here is um, a map showing our program. So this is um, in smack over, here is the high school, I don't know if you can see my person, but yeah, that's the high school and then you have the elementary school right to the right of it in that L sheet. Um, so we chose this this um, site because it is um, one of the empty sites. It, has, it just has um, some trees on it and um, there's a little road here that connects across to the other main road that they have in Arkansas. Um, so we chose here because we thought that it would be perfect for the high school to have some sort of connectedness to this space. 
um, so that students um, can attend there either during school or after school, and then that would promote their um, parents and siblings and family to come and join um, the community here in this area. So the main programs we wanted to include in our projects are spaces for production of food, food distribution, dining, community kitchen, along with programs to begin to shape the community by having spaces for children to learn, play, and socialize in, along with spaces for adults to socialize, take part in group exercise, become involved in the harvesting of products, and learn the technologies behind it. So this is just one layout of programs that we came to. Our science analysis, one of our is to increase accessibility to our site and its resources. Our the following maps show proposed bus routes and bike trails to give more people access because currently there are little to none. And these pictures show the surroundings on the site. So there is like forest, I would say, and then um, houses, and it's overall not really developed. To, pro to promote sustainability and affordability, we wanted to use shipping containers as part of our design. Um, so they're prefabricated, they can be modular, they're cost beneficial and sustainable and they, have, they can have a unique design to the community. So the main goal of ours is to include food in our narrative to change the lived experience. We want to provide fresh, desirable, healthy options as well as affordable and accessible options. So a main question we had was how can we reduce stigma involving food? So on our site, people are able to grow their own food, learn about different cultural food, as well as learn how to use fresh produce to, co to cook healthier meals. They will also have the possibility to obtain fresh hot food, canned and packaged food, and fresh produce through distribution areas. There will also be dining areas where people can socialize and connect with other people in the community and learn. So these four points bring us back to our goal. To, of how to reduce stigma. So people are able to be part of a community, learn, complete activities, and increase their well-being in this space. So when researching um, vertical farming in shipping containers, I came across uh, freight farms. So they quote, the result is a plant production powerhouse that will support your farming venture. Um, we thought about finding land we could use for farming fresh produce. Um, after, calcul after calculating the acreage we would need, it's a lot more land that we could source, and the soil for Arkansas is not um, prepared for farming. So Freight Farm uses shipping containers to vertical farm fresh produce. Their main components um, needed are space, control, water, light, and air. This introduces a way for the community to learn about how fresh, fresh farm produce um, with the use of vertical farming and shipping containers. Um, so I took a sketch, I did a sketch of the uh, freight farm shipping container layout. So it just basically has a space for the props to be in rows vertically. Um, they have their control software, which is just a computer that can be connected um, to your phone so that it's um, easily, like always being watched. Um, they have their water source that will that goes up and it waters all of their vertical farming. Um, they have a specific lighting system that um, promotes the growth of the plants and their um, the vents in the back of the shipping container for the air quality. It's just a plan layout of how that works. Um, so here's a design concept behind the vertical farming on the site. Uh, this program uses the community and learning aspect of our goals to achieve fresh produce and a better understanding of why fresh produce is important to adapt to your diet. Um, so these are just some sketches of how the vertical farming would look in the site. Um, so it would create some unique sketch, um, unique spaces within to um, in, in the outside of the shipping containers. So 
next is the design process for the dining. And we came up with two options for dining. One is the cooking and dining, and one is simply for um, dining. And for the dining itself, there would be indoor and outdoor dining. And the indoor dining would present a more formal environment, but it would also convey a casual environment with the um, cooking layout. And the, the outdoor dining would be more casual as it would be on the terrace. And in a way, it would allow the users to connect with the rest of the site. And it bring, going back to our goals, it would increase social connectedness. And next is the distribution, distributing, sorry, um, the distributing center would serve to provide food necessities to users and they're just separated in different categories. The food would be coming from restaurant surplus or incomplete foods. And we would establish a membership program that would encourage users to make use of it by giving rewards the more we use it. And only you would be aware of your rank to, um, um, to allow people to stay anonymous. So this basically is an image of like the three of the dining, distributing, and now vertical farming. Um, so moving on from food, we found it important to include various programs onto our site in order to attract as many people as we can. So the question that we posed was how can we, we reduce stigma by including other programs? So on our site, we have a community kitchen, places to take care of their body, do meditation exercise, and opportunities to learn new skills to promote creativity. So all of these bring it back to our four goals of how to reduce stigma. These activities can increase social connectedness and provide a space to learn. We decided to include a library on our site to promote learning and a sense of community. There are computer labs and fabrication labs within the library to provide people without internet services to go. And by including a fab lab, it attracts a larger group of audience as well. This brings people together to create an opportunity to learn. Um, so a few introductory programs for the recreation center includes a community kitchen, a gym area, yoga and meditation rooms, and art or pottery lesson centers. So with the use of shipping containers, this is a global area, uh, which could like later include more program and attract like, more like different people. So during their time on our site, we want parents to be able to roam freely without worrying about the kids. So we decided it was important to have a children's center. This could help relieve parents of stress, increase mental wellness, as well as increase the sense of community. So these are some images of our idea to provide a visual. So similar to what Naomi was saying, we want to promote the usage of our site uh, by implementing a program, someone to Uber where there are ranks, but only like you know your ranks. Um, in order to also increase social connectedness to reduce stigma, uh, we have an idea of like building together as a community. So in like kind of precedent we saw was a building type called you build. So it's easy to build, which only takes a hammer. Which, uh, the, like, of how easy it is, it could include students and um, become a community activity. The modular units make it a quick and efficient build as well as affordable. So, oh, like, uh, the community doesn't have to like use this new build. Another opportunity to support more local businesses is to use wood from local shops and using like balloon frame architecture, build together as a community as well. Um, based on our original site layout, we created three others that could be used based on the town's need, considering that we don't actually know the town um, dynamics. So the first one shows the learning facing the left side of the road and the food facing the other side. 
and the next one showed socializing and community activities on the sites facing the road for attraction. And then the third one shows learning and growing directly across from the school. So our main goal was to reduce the stigma around food insecurity in Smack Over. And to do this, we aim to um, rewrite the narrative for food by engaging leaders of various ages through education and activities and cross-programming. The learning experiences would um, promote inclusion and social connectedness. And all of these com combined would create a changed live experience across the board in terms of better health, increased sense of community, and more knowledge on the actual problem. Thank you. Okay, just um, to go back uh, to our uh, audience here, this was a, a brief overview of the um, pilot project in Smackover. Uh, for those of you who have an opportunity to come uh, to Venice to the Biennale, you have two um, exhibits here. One is uh, Smackover pilot and the other one is the Louisville uh, pilot. And those are on the exhibit here. And I think we move on to our first speaker here. Is that correct, Chris? So let me briefly uh, introduce um, our first uh, panelist here, uh, Brookshield Laurent. She uh, is a doctor of osteopathic medicine. She is also a chair and associate professor at the Department of Clinical Medicine at NYIT-COM at Arkansas State University and is the founding and executive director of the Delta Population Health Institute. What stood out to me on, uh, in her work in particular is uh, what I would call the involvement maybe in building uh, the important clinical uh, skills for doctors, in particular the patient um, provider relationship. And also, I think the um, important aspect about Dr. Laurent is that she is really an advocate for health equity. She's a leader in addressing the social determinant of health uh, to transform community health outcomes, in particular, of course, in the state of Arkansas. Um, let's note that she is executive director of the Delta Population Health Institute, and in that role, um, she leverages all the resources uh, in education, uh, research, but also policy and community engagement, and uh, to bring about changes, which we would call policy, system, and particularly environmental. And she will talk to us briefly about how the Institute aims to create what we call a culture of health in the state of Arkansas and in the Delta region. Uh, welcome, Dr. Laurent, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Christian and Chris. I'm very excited to be a part of this panel and um, want to uh, send my kudos to you and your entire team for um, holding this platform to have this very important conversation and to all the attendees there, here and online who is uh, viewing this and listening, I send my greetings to you. Um, I am um, placed in Jonesboro, Arkansas. That is my current residence, but I'm actually healing from the state of Washington at the moment. Um, so I just wanna say thank you again for the opportunity and also to share this panel with my uh, esteemed colleagues. So thank you, as Christian has said before, my name is Dr. Laurent. I'm the chair and associate professor for the Department of Clinical Medicine at NYIT College of Osteopathic Medicine at Arkansas State University. Um, and I also function as the executive director for the Delta Population Health Institute. I am an osteopathic family medicine physician by training, uh, taking care of, of people from the womb to the tomb, as they say. Um, and I have a very unique perspective in understanding and observing uh, the factors outside the clinical space that really affects the health of my patients. And so um, I truly uh, resonate with the work of Chris uh, um, in terms of his um, ecosystem, the health ecosystem that he has um, cr um, created this framework for us to better understand 
what is the what is going on in our environment and how do we respond to it and why do we have prevalence in our illnesses uh, in certain groups of people in certain locations and so uh, when I met Chris and heard about his work it completely resonated with the revelations and observations that I have uh, made in my residency training and I'm going to share a little bit of my journey with you um, and about why I, I am in the space of health equity, health equity and social determinants of health. Um, so what I'm showing you here is our first graduating class of osteopathic physicians um, at NYIT College of Osteopathic Medicine it has been in existence for about 40 years. And um, we opened up a second site. Our parent institution is in Long Island. We opened up a second site in Arkansas, which is known as the Delta, the Mississippi Delta. And the primary reason why we opened up the medical school was to increase the physician workforce in the Mississippi Delta. And if anyone who may not be familiar, there are some significant health challenges uh, that are in this region. And one of the ways that we want to improve some of the health outcomes is by um, recruiting, training, and placing um, physicians, competent, caring, compassionate physicians in the Delta to provide care. But we also do know that this is really a part of the solution, or actually a very quite small part of the solution is as I was in my training and began to to understand. And um, in our core curriculum, we have um, competencies that we expect our, our medical students to obtain, but we also had to supplement our core a curriculum with a co-curriculum for them to get training and understanding about the environment of their patients. As an osteopathic medicine, there are, a physician, there are about uh, four tenets in osteopathic medicine, but one of them is that structure and function are interrelated, meaning structure affects function and function affects structure. Now, and primarily we talk about the human body where the structure of any component of our body affects the function and vice versa. But we also see that the structure of our community of our environment also affects the functionality of ourselves as human beings. And so we thought it was very important for our medical students to get this training, for them to understand these outside forces outside of the, outside of the clinic, outside of the hospital um, that is affecting the health of, of, their pay, of their patients so that they can be leaders in their communities to help create a culture of health. This schematic that I'm presenting to you is from the Kaiser Family Foundation, and I have to say this was a schematic that really outlines what I began to realize early on in my medical career. And what I realized early on in my medical career was that there were factors, and one health indices here is the risk of premature death, but there are factors that are much greater than what I can do as a physician and what I can provide in a clinic or at a hospital that are actually contributing to the health outcomes of my patients. Um, so here I, I present this to my, my students all the time. 10% of all that they're all that they're going to be learning, the years of their training, the work they're doing in a hospital, it really is only 10% of health outcomes for patients. And the 90% 90, 90 of those things are out of our control. Social environmental factors, individual behavior, and genetics. I also tell my, my students, the lines that you're seeing here are not really solid. They're actually pretty perforated. And what I mean by that is our individual behaviors are not in a vacuum. Our individual behaviors are affected by social and environmental factors. Genetics actually are affected. Our genetics are affected by our environment over decades and generations. And so you have the studies of epigenetics that are telling us that our environment is actually changing us on a molecular or DNA level. And so these are things that I make our students, so I help our students understand as they're providing care that they have to start thinking more broadly in the definition of health if they want their communities to really acquire a culture of health. One of the key things, very briefly, I want to show you is that um, the, the social aspect uh, is further broken down in this schematic by six, by five pillars, economic stability, 
neighborhood and physical environment, education, food, community and social context. And again, this is another schematic of the previous slide I just showed you where the healthcare system really is just 10%. But all these other pillars that you see here are really the upstream factors. These are the real main drivers that are affecting health outcomes, affecting mortality, morbidity, life expectancy, healthcare. And I did not get training in economic stability as a physician or neighborhood and physical environment or education education or food security or further understanding a community and social context. I did not get training in that. That is not part of the core curricular in, in medical school. So it was so important for our students to understand these upstream factors so that they can have thoughtful conversations and convene leaders and multiple disciplines to come to the table to create a culture of health so that we know that those who have a lower level of literacy have a higher prevalence of illnesses and disease. There are markers where food insecurity is a food insecurity is a marker for um, prevalence of chronic illnesses. My housing situation, playgrounds, the walkability, whether I have um, sidewalks, um, my ability to pay bills and my employment stability, all these things affect our, our health outcomes. And so the definition, the working definition that I'm using is uh, adapted from the Department of Health and Human Services is where social determinants of health are the conditions and the environments where people born are born, live, learn, work, play, and worship and age. And that affects the wide range of health and functioning and quality of life outcomes and risk. And so these are the things that we are teaching our students to be aware of, but also get understanding of, and also be, as a leader, conveners of, of different leaders in the disciplines that I've mentioned before. So because of this and this reality that we're in, we created a core curriculum, we created a, a curriculum on population health. We have a certificate in population health. And population health is defined as this. It is the distribution of health outcomes within a population that determines the influence, the distribution and the policies and interventions that impact these determinants. So what we are seeing because of all the upstream factors that I just showed you is that there are groups of people broken down in multiple categories, whether it's by race, gender, geography, zip code, all have different health outcomes for various region, reasons. And these determinants of health as I'm talking about here are really impacting that. So here we have child mortality. This is a very common and very um, unfortunate uh, slide that I show my students where you have disproportionate rates of infant, infant mortality amongst different people of color. So there's a higher 11% higher rate of infant mortality in Black, Hispanic, um, American Indian, and Alaskan Natives compared to the white population. Um, I also show age-adjusted death rates per 100,000 uh, people of selected diseases. You see that people of color have a higher rate of heart disease and cancer um, when compared to other populations, specifically white population. And so these are things that I present to my students, but I ask, I ask, I ask them to think critically, why is that here? What is the prevalence of this illness, of the illnesses in different groups of people? We can, we can also break this down in geography. So the area that I circled here is my home base. This is Arkansas here, but the big line that I circled here is called the Delta Regional, um, a Delta Region, the Mississippi Delta Region. It encompasses about um, eight states have, has 252 counties. And the reason why we're known as the Delta Mrs. Delta Regional Area is because those counties are in proximity or touches the Mississippi River. That's that line that you see here that separates Arkansas and Tennessee. So we touch the Arkansas, the Mississippi River. Um, Arkansas and all these areas here that I noted here are mostly rural. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about rurality, this state, just to give you some context if you're not from the U.S. The U.S. is mostly a rural state. There's a lot of metropolitan well-known cities, but the U.S. is pretty, pretty much a rural state. And the greater the, large, the greater the hue of green that you see here represents the, um, um, the rurality of, of the country. And so it's been a changing landscape. This is a, this is a schematic from the United States Census Bureau where we have seen an increased population in urban population, but then a decrease in a number of in rural populations. So from the 1910, the rural population was about 50% in the US and now it's down close to 19.3% here in terms of the schematic landscape. 
Um, it's also important for me to define your role. And I'm not going to go too much into this, but one of the things that's very difficult for us in living in rural areas is that there is at least 15 definitions in the U.S. government for rurality. Um, and that actually is very challenging because we don't have a general consensus. One of the definitions I'm bringing here that's commonly used is from the U.S. Census definition that defines rurality primarily by what is urban. So the definition of rural starts with what is urban. And if you fall out of the urban um, uh, definition, that's what rural is. And so it's not really um, specific. There are different um, agencies that have different numbers. But if you were to look at some general characteristics, you would see some low population and density, small numbers of people, low levels of urbanizations. There's a distance or proximity to urban centers. And there's some sense of isolation and remote remoteness. So again, this, this, this issue with rurality is a significant problem. It it's a, a lot of challenges. And the reason why, when you think in terms of policy, it affects the equity of distribution because there are different challenges and different definitions. There's um, some measurement biases when we do research. So how can you fully understand the complexities of rurality if there isn't a consensus, consensus in a definition of what it is? So there's some bias in the measurement, the interpretation of outcomes, uh, who's eligible for what when it comes to grants and some significant policy implications. What I wanted to show you here is the Delta regional area. Again, this is the eight states with 252 counties. The areas with the darkest level of red shows where there is uh, poverty. It's higher than the United States. Um, nationally, but the Delta region, again, has the highest number of poverty. This is just another area, a graph that shows a schematic of obesity. So the darker the hue of green shows the um, largest number, uh, the, the largest number percentage of individuals with obesity. Again, all of them touching the Mississippi River here. And when we are zoning into Arkansas here, the areas in dark gray are urban centers urban centers and everything around it are rural and the rural areas are broken down in three regions. It's about 3 million people in Arkansas and 41 folks live, a percent of folks live in rural areas. About 25% of the people are black indigenous and people of color, what we call BIPOC communities. The average income in the US is about 47, but compared to the 47,000, compared to the national average, which is about 62,000, but in rural areas it's about 14% lower than the state average. And very briefly, I'm just going to show you because I know I'm running out of time. Um, Arkansas, um, this is just all the counties of Arkansas. The areas of darkest green here is where we have the, the, the most challenges, the greatest challenge of health outcomes. And so this area here, this is the Delta region. This is the area that we focus on here um, is where you have significant health challenges. And we are the lower quartile of health outcomes in the state. Just by employment sectors in, the, in, in Arkansas, the blue bars represents rural areas. The highest number of people we have are in professional services, manufacturing, trade, uh, government, uh, transportation, and utilities. About 40% of people living in rural Arkansas do not have high-speed internet in terms of infrastructure here. Um, when it comes to bridges, the condition of the bridges can be fair to poor conditions, certainly compared to our urban counterparts. Um, we have here in the rural areas, there's a lot of fair, when we compare the rural areas to urban areas, we have more bridges that are in poor condition. For infrastructure, out of the 75 counties, 41% of the counties have had drinking water violations. And it, they, uh, the American Society for Civil Engineers estimate about $7.38 billion would be needed to upgrade the drinking systems. Um, poverty, when you look at rurality for poverty for children under 18, it's very high compared to the urban counterparts here, just comparing rural plus urban. These three areas here are just uh, different regions of the rural areas here, but uh, we certainly are high when it comes to children in poverty. We also have disparities even within rural areas amongst races where people of color have higher health disparities in rural areas as well. Um, there's a ratio of rural to urban death rates, unintentional injuries, suicide, chronic lung disease, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. So I just want to make note here, when we talked about health equity, when we look at rural counties with majority Black and Indigenous people, we have the highest rate of premature death in the U.S. And if you were to look at this map here, this red here is the Mississippi Delta, where we have the majority where non-Hispanic Black folks live here as well. Okay.
Great, a lot of data right now on why the disparities are here and the role that social and economic determinants play uh, in this. And that is a lot of the, what I was talking about earlier about the upstream factors. When we look about these health disparities, you must consider the social factors and the economic determinants that are causing these things. And the last thing I'm gonna show you is how we as the Delta Population Health uh, Institute is addressing these complex situations that we're in. You know, it's always a challenge for me to present things that are going on in Arkansas, as much of the challenges that I just presented to you, Arkansas is an incredible state with a lot of resiliency, with incredible people doing a lot of great things. Um, and so because of that, we would not be really where we are right now in terms of what has been accomplished and the opportunity we have is, as an institution to walk alongside incredible people that are from Arkansas who are doing a lot of great work. And so we have adopted a, a framework called Health in All Policies. Uh, it identifies the ways in which the decisions and multiple sectors affect health and how, um, how improved health can support the goals of those sectors as well. So it goes back about 35 years ago, started with the World Health, World health Organization, and it's a framework to address the social determinants of health that I talked about before, which are driving the health outcomes. It supports improved health outcomes and health equity. And what I love about this model is that you must have non-traditional partners at the table. Doctors can't fix this alone. Hospitals can't fix this alone. You have to have economic developers at the table. You need to have community designers at the table, people around food security, economic developers, educators at the table to say, how can we create a culture of health? If I were to put a health lens in my sector, how can that create further and great opportunities in my community, in my rural community to improve health overall? So we have to think above our own silos as has been mentioned before. So there are five, five key elements. We promote health equity with this framework. You support intersectoral collaboration. There are great, great co-benefits with multiple partners. I, I almost can guarantee that if a, any sector that thinks about health as a priority in their goals, that can also help their bottom line and catalyze their goals as well. You wanna engage multiple stakeholders creating structural and process change. So it's a collaborative approach to improving health. You got to have uh, health decisions in your decision making to assure that you have a culture of health. I want to thank you for the opportunity to present and I look forward to your thoughts and your questions. Christian, I believe you're muted. Thank you, Dr. Laurent. Uh, this was an amazing uh, talk and introduction, I think, for our wider audience on those really important aspects of population health. And uh, we saw through your presentation also how it really folds into uh, questions of design, of urban design, and also of planning in general. And this is, um, I think, for me, the, um, the largest uh, aspect of stakeholders that we can bring in uh, to this discussion. And we have here our next panelist, uh, which is Dr. Edgar Stach, that will uh, particularly speak now to the topic on, on smart cities. And uh, Professor Stach is a, a professor at uh, Thomas Jefferson University in, in Philadelphia at the College of Architecture and the Built Environment and also at the College of Design, Engineering and Commerce. Uh, he writes uh, on technology and design and just to name uh, some of those topics he covers, uh, one in particular maybe is daylighting systems in museums, a very recent oeuvre, but he also in particular embraces energy efficiency, uh, ecological sensitivity, and of course, the environmental sensibility. Yeah? Uh, his recent publications that uh, speak to his expertise, particularly to technology, is a book on Nils van der Rohe, and he would talk about space, material, and detail. Um, uh, published in Birkhäuser, and another recent book is uh, on the work from Renzo Piano, Building Workshop, that talks about uh, space, detail, and light. And so we see that uh, from uh, this kind of uh, bridging now over to uh, architecture and urban design and materials and details, et cetera, that this is really where we can contribute to this larger discourse. And yeah, we are looking forward here um, to the presentation of Dr. Stach. And I will launch uh, his presentation here and give him um, the word in a moment.
Well, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm really thrilled to be here in the uh, Italian Pavilion talking about um, yeah, a really big topic, um, population health in the urban um, room. So I'm from Philadelphia, just to give you a little bit of a, an idea where Philadelphia sits. It's uh, one of the largest cities in uh, the US. Um, economically extremely challenged. Um, Philadelphia dropped by about a half a million inhabitants over the last 30 years and just recently comes back um, in, in terms of numbers and inhabitants within the city. Um, the um, economics are really problematic in Philadelphia. So the average income, household income in Philadelphia is about 50% from the national income. Um, when it comes to health disparities within the city, the most important code we all have when it comes to health expectations is actually our zip code. And the zip code matters greatly in Philadelphia. So the difference between the rich neighborhoods and the very poor neighborhoods in Philadelphia is more than 20 years in terms of life expectation differences. So that's, that's just a framework where I'm sort of operating in. Um, Jefferson University is a medium-sized private university, but there's a very big footprint in the health arena. We have 16 hospitals within the city and the city outskirts. And um, we have a full-fledged uh, university um, as well attached to the healthcare sectors. So, um, for a long time, the university was really rooted greatly in only the medical fields. Um, health was everything we did in, for the last hundred years. And um, through a merger with a, with a different university, another university, we really became a full-fledged comprehensive university with the social sciences, architecture, engineering, and so forth. So to, to work on the aspect of population health and smart and healthy cities, we formed an institute, Institute for Smart and Healthy Cities, which really um, this uh, transdisciplinary research, educate and, um, and works on innovation um, with multiple disciplines. So it's primarily located in the College of Architecture, Population Health and the design disciplines. So the aim is really to develop new ways we live, work, travel within our urban, um, urban set uh, settlement places here. So, so what, what is, the, is the big aim for the Institute? So um, we're focusing on urban settings um, and we really wanna look into how to turn um, our cities, old cities sometimes in the US are several hundred years old, but in other areas, uh, parts of the world, they are perhaps much, much older. Um, we focusing on urban settings and want to incorporate, uh, incorporate um, aspects like society, quality of life, the environment, government, economics, and mobility. And all these aspects really contribute to uh, smart cities and also contribute to enhancing the quality of life and uh, the quality of or the performance of an urban service. So in, in large, we're looking in architecture, health, energy, transportation, and utilities. Um, so I, I just said before that we are a university is a very large footprint in the health sector. And we just saw in the previous presentation, a similar graph. So, you know, from, Typically, doctors think that they actually responsible for the health of people or population. And again, it's just a relatively small percentage what actually the healthcare system contributes to population health. Health behavior has a much larger input in the individual health. And then for sure, the physical environment and the social economic factors are really the driving forces when it comes to the population health, life expectation, and equity of, of equal, 
um, equality and um, equal opportunities for, for all of us. So if we know that the healthcare is actually contributing only for a relatively small amount in our population health, we need to connect the dots. And that was really the paradigm we had to found our institute, really looking into population health, economic drivers, real estate, environmental aspects, and so far. So again, so we're looking into the built environment, we're looking into urban planning, infrastructure, transportation, and buildings, but also recreational spaces and energy, how is energy produced, but also how is energy polluting our environment. We're looking into data and technology. So how to collect data, how to sense and interact with buildings and cities. So enlarge the internet of things. And then again, a very important aspect is population health in large. So the environmental aspects and the social determinants of health. So we frame the, uh, the, the, uh, the aspects looking into smart and healthy cities by looking at scale. So one research area, the largest scale is the urban scale where we're looking closely um, into the interrelationship between, between uh, urbanization, transportation, energy, and population health. Air pollution, green infrastructure, public parks, access, to these um, uh, city, city aspects is really important. We're also analyzing human behavior on an urban scale. So it's really analytically driven. Um, and we evaluate um, through our research, what if we change certain indi indicators or certain aspects within the city? For example, what if we introduce more bike lanes or green urban uh, parks or well, we purpose infrastructure to, uh, let's say, neighborhood parts. What is the impact on population health and human behavior in, these, in, in this respect? The next scale is really the building scale, where we're also looking into what are the effects of, for example, natural daylighting and ventilation in the health outcome of um, people living or working or even healing in these spaces. You know, I mentioned we holding a lot of real estate in, um, in hospitals and uh, related buildings. So again, I think we, we focused for a long time, it's a functionality of buildings, but not really the well-being of the individual living in these buildings. So we, in our institute, develop new concepts for sustainability. For example, for our hospital inventory, and we want to understand better human behavior in relationship to building systems, spaces, and environments. When it comes to the smaller scale, the device scale, we also look into how can we as a human being, as an individual, control our own environment within buildings, for example. How do we interact with the built environment, cities, and how is that affecting my personal uh, well-being? by controlling um, in, a, in a much better way, sort of um, see my microcosmos within, um, within um, uh, the area I'm living in. So one of the research projects we took on was really looking at the uh, social determinants of health in large. And um, I will talk a little bit what these um, social determinants of health are. So this is a research project, which is probably multi, multi year long, but we, we um, focused right now, focusing right now on some of, some of the lower hanging foods. So the idea here is really transforming urban environments into healthy and social communities. And by creating accessibility and um, equitable means of analyzing social health of cities for targeted social interventions, and strategy investments, which means that we want to look at the entire ecosystem of social determinants of health and want to see how they all connected, interrelated to each other. By doing so, we're developing a parametric tool which really understands the uh, interconnectivity and the relationships between these different social determinants of health, but also 
through the tool, we're able to uh, foresee and forward predict um, effects if we're changing certain aspects. And I will explain that um, more in depth in a, in a second. So what are the um, um, indicators for health? So we um, identified 11 social determinants of health categories, housing, transportation, economic well-being, crime and safety, health, literature, environmental aspects, population health, energy consumption, and so far. And on the right hand side, sure you can't read this, but you see the 11 indicators, but also you see the interconnectivity of all these different in, um, indicators. And again, through a parametric tool, an automated tool, we will be able to see the outcomes of some of, of all of these uh, indicators if we change certain aspects or make strategic investments in these aspects. For example, looking in transportation and mobility. Well, uh, for sure, we want to move from a combustion engine driven transportation and, um, to sustainable transportation modes. Um, so we have to look at the entire ecosystem of transportation. We have to look at the stakeholders who are involved in making these decisions. What are the direct indicators? You know, for example, what's the land use? What is the infrastructure? How can we change infrastructure? Um, what is the quality of infrastructure? Um, so what are the, the um, we, how, how can we repurpose infrastructure from streets to bike lanes to walkable environments? And then again, the idea is here to make predictions in other areas. For example, the health outcome, if we're turning um, streets into bike lanes and invite uh, our population to use these bike lanes in a, in a much more meaningful way. So zooming in, looking at just the streets, um, one project is really looking into how to increase um, the uh, number of trips um, our urban dwellers uh, do by using sustainable transportation modes. And our goal setting is by 2040, we want that 80% of all these trips are done by either walking, cycling, car share, or public transportation. So, and um, so in the, in the wheel on the right hand side, you see what are the criteria to make that actually really happen. So you have to look at the easy access to um, you know, alternative transportation modes. Um, you have to increase the quality of our street systems by reducing noise and pollution. We have to make the road system safer, um, air cleaner, I mentioned. So in, in large, we have to increase the quality of our urban environment actually to achieve the goal that people start moving away from the individual cars to um, alternative transportation modes. So, so how to, to deal with um, a construct like that in a parametric uh, concept and a computational tool. So you have inputs and outputs and the inputs are on three different scales. You have the street level, so the direct interaction. You have to uh, measure the quality of this, um, the road system. You have to see what needs to change to increase the quality and to invite people. And then it goes to the next level up, the network level, how to connect now, for example, bike lanes in an urban setting really to, um, to build a complete new infrastructure, whether the city, which is, again, enables everybody to use the system in large. And then there's strategic levels or strategic goals uh, where um, the system has to also change policies and planning or has to become a planning tool. So the environmental health obviously is a big driver for population health. Um, it's also a huge um, economic driver. Um, so things like housing conditions, air quality, the working environment, and all these aspects are um, extremely important on the uh, population health, individual health aspect. So we, in our computational tool, we will look into 
for example, um, what's the biodiversity within our cities? How can we increase this, for example, to lower air pollutants within the air or lower the um, effects of uh, noise within the city, but just increase the quality of our urban environments. We're looking into humidity, again, green infrastructure. We're also looking into alternative energy uh, systems like solar energy within the city to reduce pollutants from combustion uh, power plants or coal-fired power plants. Um, water runoff, really important. Philadelphia has not even a separate uh, sewage system, so every storm generates an overflow within the sewage a system and pollutes the, uh, the rivers downstream from Philadelphia. So again, you can see that the environmental health in large, again, is connected to many other aspects um, within the 11 indicators of health. Housing very, is a very, very large uh, contributor to the quality of life in urban settings. Again, we need to, um, we need to look into the um, the indoor air qualities, we will have to really in increase natural ventilation, uh, ventilation and uh, natural lighting. And I'll give you an example. I pitched to our medical um, colleagues um, that if they would contribute a fraction of the cost for healthcare treating respiratory diseases like asthma to increasing the quality of the housing stock, you would save a ton of money on the healthcare side because you will solve the problem. It's the first place where people live and get sick. For example, by mediating mold in buildings or uh, better indoor quality. So this uh, brings me to the end of uh, my presentation. So the takeaway is really that if you're looking at uh, um, smart and healthy cities and population health, you really have to cast a very wide net and you have to connect um, the dots. So investments in one area maybe contribute in a positive health outcome in multiple other areas and vice versa. And our parametric tool enables us to do forward prediction and strategic planning where to invest money first to achieve the, the greatest um, uh, benefits in terms of population health and individual health. All right, um, thank you, Dr. Stach, for this um, really exciting uh, overview on the expertise and the recent inauguration of the Institute at uh, Jefferson. And also, as we see here, again, the uh, strong uh, interdisciplinary or let's say transdisciplinary collaboration between experts in population health and of course on the design and, and architecture sector. Uh, speaking about architecture, I would like now to introduce um, our third panelist uh, for today. And uh, we're talking here about Simone Estriso, who is a co-principal at TAM Associati here in Italy. He is also uh, a professor at uh, Bowen Smith in, in the UK, but let's say most of his uh, um, um, dedication is of course to his uh, practical work. And that's exactly what we want to look at right now. So he leads a team of, of architects and researchers and um, Many of the building solutions or all of the building solutions exactly um, express the spirit that we tried to catch uh, in our uh, discussion until now, which is um, the focus on uh, building resiliency in communities, uh, the increasing of capacities uh, in communities and their work because it spans uh, really all the globe. Um, as you see, there's many places in Africa or in particularly in disaster um, driven communities like in Syria is really uh, exciting to see somebody practicing in that kind of area. Um, there's many awards and, 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 and um, uh, recognitions of their work. I want to cite maybe just a few of them. Um, in 2013, they received the Aga Khan Award for Architecture for the Salam Center for Cardi Cardiac, Cardiac Surgery in uh, Sudan. They received also the very well-known Capuchin Prize for the construction of the world's most sustainable um, pediatric uh, uh, hospital, again, also in Port Sudan. They received also the Curry Stone Prize for the overall sustainability, social and environmental 
of recent projects built in different parts of the world. And in 2014, as an example, they also received the Zoom Tobel Group Award, very known, of course, in the technology area for innovation and sustainability. Um, Thomas Ciati is also uh, the recipient or was named uh, Italian Architect of the Year in 2014, of course, in relationship uh, to many of those projects and dedicated in particular for its ability to enhance the ethical dimension uh, of the profession, right? That's exactly what we want to talk about right now. Uh, they also won in 2017 the Lafarge Holzim Awards acknowledgement for the project Maisha Film Lab uh, in Kampala in Uganda. And uh, Simone has also been on the curatorial team of the Italian Pavilion not very long ago. And so he knows about um, the extreme uh, opportunity here that we have in this kind of uh, public venue to discuss those themes and hopefully with that engage a lot of our listeners and our audience uh, worldwide. And so with that, I wanna give the word now here uh, to Simone Friso and, and show us the exciting work of his project. And let me sh uh, share here the slideshow for him. A moment here, we are on here in a second. Okay, here we go. All right, <clears throat> we are all ready to go here, a moment. Okay. So, thank you very much, Christian, uh, for your uh, kind presentation. I'm really glad to be here. And it, uh, in a way, it's also meaningful for me to be here as we, as we have been uh, creators in uh, 2016 of the uh, Italian Pavilion. And uh, at that time, we have uh, entitled our presentation, uh, our uh, curatorial uh, presentation, uh, Taking Care. So as uh, health and care are two words are intimately connected, uh, talking about health uh, and uh, care today is uh, definitely important for me. And um, yes, well, um, Thomas Sociati has been founded uh, more than 20 years ago. And uh, we are a firm based uh, here in, uh, in Venice, uh, in the historical uh, uh, center of Venice. And uh, yeah, we have worked mainly uh, abroad in the last 15 years, uh, uh, maybe in, in, in the global south, uh, in the uh, African continent, and also in the uh, Middle East as well, in uh, countries such as uh, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, the north, uh, the north of Iraq. Um, the last 15 years, so we have worked uh, mainly on uh, the boundaries. Uh, when I refer to boundaries, I refer to the boundaries of the uh, urban uh, settlements. And, um, no, sorry. Okay. But also to the, um, can I say, the, 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 the social boundaries, so the boundaries between uh, inclusion and exclusion as well. And, um, this condition has allowed us uh, to, to, uh, to observe uh, human settlements uh, from a peripheral point of view. And um, on the boundaries, we have tried to, um, to realize projects conceived as commons, uh, considering that in the popular sense of uh, common good in a specific resource shared uh, by all the members of a given community. Uh, so we have uh, considered the boundaries as lands of possible encounters uh, rather than the limits of, of uh, exclusion. Architectural design 
has been conceived for us uh, in our firm and our uh, work as an opportunity to move the line a bit further beyond the horizon, turning the exclusion in uh, sustainable development of human settlements to be considered as uh, a wall. The idea of taking care uh, of places and communities in a way uh, is a final purpose of design our point of view. So taking care is uh, for us a sort of statement. Uh, it gives us a, a vision of uh, architecture in the service of community, of places in relationship uh, they establish with built and ecological environments. It seeks to show how architecture makes, makes a difference when it takes care of individuals, of community, spaces and places, principles and communities. Um, architecture in this way, uh, concentrated on society, can curb the marginalization and exclusion and become a driving force for new visions, a powerful medium for communicating, an instrument through which many boundaries can claim rights, progress, opportunities, and, inclu and inclusion. Um, with our work, we try to offer tangible proof of that how architecture with its specific uh, disciplinary tools can help and spread, uh, make effect the principles of sociality, participation, uh, healthcare, integration, and uh, legality, everywhere and on every scale. By embodying these principles, uh, um, architecture in this millennium will increasingly have to engage and will and uh, we've had find the answers to the challenge of that cities and environment present, not only to architects, but to all the most responsible designers of the near future. Our work stems from a specific idea of architecture as a collective task, collective effort in which we have involved other approaches, particularly attentive to places, communities, and local resources. The field of experimentation for us has been of international cooperation addressed to the construction of healthcare facilities in the, in the global south, Africa, uh, sub saharan uh, area, especially sub saharan area. Uh, we have started to work in uh, Sudan, we have also worked in uh, Central African Republic, uh, Uganda, um, all those places. Uh, uh, where uh, you can find big, big and complex uh, requests of uh, high quality uh, healthcare. And uh, at the same time, you have very few, um, very small budgets, uh, difficulty in, uh, in founding uh, material, uh, materials. And so, uh, you have to deal with uh, these two, it seems to be opposite uh, aspects. The projects that I'm showing uh, in these slides were born, born from these appro approaches, often working with limited resources, but uh, uh, rich of sharing processes. And it has grown through constant exchanges with local communities uh, in the process of construction of meaning with which seeks to establish common categories uh, such as belonging, identity, sharing, and understanding. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, the idea of uh, this idea of architecture is a very pragmatic idea of architecture, I can say, does not promise a new te theory. Uh, we are definitely a, a practice firm. Uh, rather, um, this idea is constructed as a complex practice conducted through participatory processes, as I have already said. Uh, and so in this complex and often disaggregated setting, architecture has to re reconstruct its own role as common understanding, appropriately disseminated and shared, capable of caring of places and developing human, human capital in every community. So um, the boundary uh, in, uh, is in fact, uh, in uh, my point of view, 
not just the physical space, as I, as I have already said, but there's also a mental space, uh, namely the cultural margins in which the essential idea of living has to be found. Architecture will continue to act as an instrument of resistance only if it is able to cope with this marginalization and build new contexts in which this part of society identifies its, itself and can organize the rules by which it lives. It will have to deal with many challenges by participatory design, intelligent, I can say, creative and effective, caring and responsible, we certainly succeed in undermining the status quo, conceiving the build better, the build and building better places. And since in architecture, politics become places, design is also a powerful reminder of the responsibilities and potential of politics in, in everyone's lives. And architectural construct, fix, fixed or mobile, temporary or permanent, can become a, po a political subject that defends and affirms people's rights. Architecture, by definition, is an agent of in the processes of manipulation and transformation of goods. But it also participates increasingly in the process of affirmation of values such as identity, awareness, appropriation, care, values involved in any process of construction and management of spaces and goods. And all the more so when uh, they take on the character of a common good. Paraphesis is that the process itself constitutes a common good capable of generating new knowledge, a sharing of resources, the spread of democracy and greater comity. It is the task of architecture to gather the best energies to meet this challenge without withdrawing its own specialist universe remote from the society with its claims to serve. The need to reconsider architecture and more generally design as a collective work capable of taking care of common goods at the service of the community emerges strongly. The process of generating and implementing an inclusive pro project must therefore be structured in such a way as it involves designers, institutions, and users to construct of the two in the construction of a common good, capable of transcending the mere utility of a, or aesthetics of an architectural object. So the research of beauty and empathy with a, the physical and social context constitutes constitute the true foundation of design and balance between environmental impact resources, ambition, and respect for local culture. culture. The beauty in the space between of a building is the space in between of a building. Not only the physical space, but also the intangible space of care, inclusion, sharing, and rights. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simone, for this uh, really um, in-depth expl explanation and, and, and journey on so many projects um, that really speak to um, the theme maybe of, of our uh, talk today, which is design and health or health and design, however you think what comes first. And uh, also I think what was very um, uh, outstanding in these explanations was the kind of transdisciplinary effect of co-creating um, between designers and other experts uh, or consultants, population health, etc., that will help us to understand, of course, the needs of communities, frame their needs, and then uh, start to evolve with them a solution that might best actually understand and serve their needs. Yeah. So at this point, um, we are uh, uh, opening our uh, round table um, to some discussions and some questions uh, to our panelists and see that we get uh, maybe some additional feedback from them on the experience as it can contribute to um, our discourse today. And uh, if our audience has some questions, please uh, feel free to use our chat and, uh, and let us know 
what um, kind of is, is most close at your heart that we should um, touch on. Chris, do you want to launch maybe um, a first question? We have, of course, a set prepared by ourselves. You need to unmute yourself. Indeed, thank you. <laughs> Common occurrence, it seems that. I think, yeah, I mean, we seem to be at an intersection, uh, a cusp of thinking differently in relation to COVID and what the pandemic has taught us. Uh, it's, for, for me, it's taught us that it, health is fundamentally interactional. Um, whether, you know, all, all of our, as I described in my talk, I characterize the human as a sort of homo ecosystemus rather than homo economicus. And so I think with that uh, sort of view of the human and the, the origin and nature of health, my question would be, has architecture flirted or, 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 or cemented a school of thought uh, in, in relation, in its practice in relation to health? Or, and, and why hasn't that sort of stuck around? And is it true the case that we're at a sort of cusp where urban design architecture can affect a better, a bigger role in health? And uh, the, the aspects we're learning today, uh, to what degree they can become widespread in practice rather than, uh, you know, fa fantastic successful examples, perhaps on, on a limited scale. So, so what can architecture really do to energize, to affect this, the scaled uh, adoption of a, a practice influencing health? My question. So we maybe orient that to uh, Dr. Star, to Edgar? Can you yeah. Can, can you summarize just briefly the question? What, what can architecture do to affect scale in its practice for influencing and shaping uh, uh, health and experiences with health? Uh, uh, well, I, I think, um, you know, as I try to explain, I see um, smart and healthy environments really in three scales. One is the urban scale, the entire sort of city scale, this, everything which makes a city, whether it deals with energy, uh, consumption or production, transportation, green infrastructure, but also the social economic areas within the city, access to food, food disparity, that's something we, we talked about today, um, access to health, uh, healthcare facilities, equal access to healthcare facilities. You know, all these things, are, they matter really in an urban scale. Um, and, you know, at least in the Western world, 80% of the population lives in cities. So it's really, I think, we, we really have to make sure that our urban systems really start functioning again, or maybe they never function really to, to, to begin with. And then, again, when, when you zoom in, quality of architecture, that's an aspect. So and for too long, maybe we just uh, looked at the aesthetics and not really the performance criteria. And then we only looked at the energy performance criteria, but not really the environmental health performance criteria. And I'm, um, you know, I'm really thrilled to see all these hospitals in developing countries, which to, I think, a large extent perform probably better than our old hospitals in the Western world because due to the fact that air conditioning is maybe not available, natural ventilation and lighting is actually better than in our sort of obsolete hospitals we're still operating in. So, and then, you know, I, I don't want to re repeat what I said before, and then even in a small scale, so there are variable devices which uh, can increase quality of life very greatly, uh, controlling our environment, but also monitoring our well-being. So, Again, for me, it's a multi-prong, a multi-scale problem, which is covers every single aspect of life. Would one sort of a development of my question would be the, the focus of architecture seems to be on the more material environmental factors that are observable, discernible, detectable. Uh, in, for example, improving air quality, improving air conditioning buildings, uh, healthy buildings. 
the, the work we were doing with the students was a lot on social factors, social interactions, and how a, a designed space might affect new forms of more, for example, inclusive social interactions. Um, so I wonder to what degree that sort of social connectedness aspect of uh, which can be so influential in people's experience of place and can lead to uh, poor, poor experiences that can lead to disease. To what degree is architecture working within that sort of realm of the, uh, the origin, the development of, of experiences with, with disease, as opposed to the sort of more observable, as I say, material realm? Yeah, maybe it could be, could have uh, or, uh, Brooke or Simone share maybe some thoughts on that. The way how, let's say, the, the place uh, and health interconnect, I think we saw very strongly in, in, in your work, Simone, right? Yeah, well, um, as I've tried to explain and show though with the slideshows that uh, we always try to set up a participatory processes because we, um, can I say, uh, architecture is a definitive actor. Uh, when you work uh, on a place, you, you, you change it for, for a long time, some, sometimes forever. And so uh, architects, uh, designers have a great responsibility. So it's really important to um, start with uh, round tables in which uh, to try to involve uh, commitments, uh, um, of medical staff, of administrative staff, uh, the local communities as well, because it's a, sort of a tailor, uh, tailor made, uh, every time it's sort of tailor made project. And so uh, what is important for a designer, for an architect is to listen and to translate uh, in uh, spaces and places, uh, uh, all the requests. That means uh, uh, that you also have to, to, to to deal with the conflicts uh, because uh, uh, otherwise uh, uh, architecture is a sort of manipulation. So uh, it is, uh, uh, and okay, in, in, in we have been really lucky because in the last 15 years uh, we have worked uh, in, in the south of the world, in the global south, but also in, in, in our world, in the luckiest part of the world. And so uh, for us, it has been a sort of a back and forth journey in which we have relearned uh, how to be architects, uh, dealing with uh, uh, conditions of, uh, of um, extreme poverty, dealing with uh, the, the, the scar scarcity. Uh, and um, how can I say, in the last year, we have uh, experienced this sort of uh, uh, shared vulnerability. And um, as, uh, as uh, Tessa Maria Guasson said in uh, 2019 in the Philippines pavilion. So it seems now that uh, nature is uh, our great leveler. Uh, and so what we have learned uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in an African continent uh, is what we are trying to bring uh, in, uh, in, uh, in our world. In world. Uh, so because uh, uh, the requests are, are uh, mainly the same, there is, a, uh, there is a need of uh, quality, there is a need of healthcare, but at the same time, we have also in our world to deal with uh, scarcity of material. So it is about really finding the right gesture when you, when you, when you approach to a, to a project. Yes, shall we maybe um, introduce here also maybe some words from uh, Brooke, and I, I thought maybe you want to expand uh, on your experience of maybe the social connectedness and the interaction related to health and how far that is maybe playing an important role. And maybe you saw some of the dots in the work of, of Tamas Ucciate and Simone Frieza's work in, in relation to that. How, how do you see that? Yeah, I, I would love to respond to that. So uh, one of the major drivers we talked about in the social determinants of health, one of the, the factors were social contexts 
um, and whether a community member actually feels connected to their community. And that could be for a lot of different reasons. One example would be if there's a sense of discrimination and they feel like they don't belong into a space. And if there were policies historically, you know, in, in the United States, you have uh, historical, um, um, the historical context of racism and segregation and the appendages of that that remains today that affect the physical space of people, where you see areas that were highly segregated segregated in the United States are the areas where you have prevalence of illnesses because that was the areas that were uninvested. They were divested. They were not invested in terms of resources, in terms of, of where um, planners wanted to build, where education was invested. And because of that, uh, you see a lot of prevalence of illnesses in these regions. And so when we talk about uh, policies that doesn't support um, um, uh, truly unification or cohesion or inclusiveness, you do see these disparities of health. And the question I would pose is, if you're building a space, how can you create a space that can support cohesion, inclusiveness, and openness, and also um, uh, catalyze people who want to invest further into that, into those areas. And so we talk about, and this is some of the work that Chris has talked about, about lived experiences before we build anything, asking the people who will be using the space, what is important to you? What are your assets? How do you use the space? What is, how do you define health? And so asking those questions first before building creates a greater sense of functionality, cohesion. And because of people, and I'll, I'll tell you the experiences that people have had in rural areas, and I'll say in Arkansas, I can speak to Delta, there are a lot of people who want to come in and build things apart from the experiences that people truly have in the space. So you have beautiful erections of buildings or spaces that people don't use because there was a disconnect of how people experience that place, that community. Um, and so it's so important to have those conversations, thoughtful conversations at first. If I can come in on that, Brooke, that, that's why I put sort of affects as the mechanisms between the factors and that form experience, and also in a way prior to determinants. So the, the original, if we try to ask the question, how do negative experiences, are you with disease or what I would say dis-ease, the, the, the sense of discrimination, exclusion, those aspects of living in place where you experience negative affects, which can then lead to stresses that can lead to uh, chronic diseases, um, that's obesity, food insecurity, food, food and other behaviors. We have to go right into those originating mechanisms of that form experience themselves. And that's why I, I argue that in a way social context, social determinants, this sort of thrust towards that now, the problem with determinants is that kind of everywhere. And, 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 the, and we can't easily distinguish between different determinants in terms of their actual relationship to health outcomes. And so the downstream outcomes, there's a disconnect between what we may think as the upstream categories of factors. And in the middle then are these experiences, these affects that actually are the, the mechanisms that produce that transition our actual lived experience. And so that's, that's why I sort of take a little critical view of determinants. It's great that we're focusing on that and looking at those upstream factors that can produce disease, but we have to have a, a way of seeing the production, the, the origination, the differentiation of, of disease, uh, because merely a downstream outcome and an upstream determinant, we're missing all the parts in the middle that explain their actual relationship to one another. Uh, and so that's where I say the empirical models that we're adopting, I think are missing these sort of more underlying drivers of actual disease. And understanding those is, is and affecting those, I think, is where architecture, urban design can play a really fantastic role in, in creating positive affects in space, such as the social stigma group in, in the course, looking at social stigma. So how can we create a space that addresses the experience of social stigma? And so that, that affects the mechanisms of the production of disease. Um, so. So uh, thank you, uh, Chris, for uh, for bringing that to our <clears throat> to our attention here, and I, I think that leads directly to to the point that Bruco just spoke about. So he will be got to a, a practitioner and and a colleague of mine that um, tries to kind of make change on on a more institutional level. Um, where does really health and start, right? So where do we really start from? In that sense, we also have. Um, 
a question here from one of our audience uh, members, um, Dr. Uh, Paul Barrick. Hi, Paul. Thanks for joining here. And uh, he says, um, while we are reading here all the questions, he says, um, how can hospital design directly improve uh, the quadruple aim of health, safety, productivity, and joy, and living awareness <clears throat> of staff and produce a value for society, right? So here we have, of course, a, 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 a provider driven question, mm -hmm. how does hospital design um, contribute? So maybe one of our yeah, I'm happy to give it a shot. colleagues want to hear uh, so, chime in. So I'm, I'm really keen on um, proper natural lighting, natural ventilation in any space, and especially in hospitals, really important. You know, airborne diseases, so you need to take care about these. Typically, you do that through mechanical systems, but it's much, much better just to ventilate naturally. So um, there's actually research out there which proves that if a hospital has a state-of-the-art facade with proper lighting and natural ventilation, patients leave the hospital an average a day earlier than in um, coming uh, in, in comparison to hospitals where lighting is not really good and that ventilation is not very proper. So the, what, what I'm saying is that um, if our buildings perform better, the, there's a direct relationship to the patient outcome. And not only the patient outcome, but also the working environment is better and satisfactory and the people working there are more satisfied and so forth. So it has, the building performance has a direct implication in patient outcome and the well-being of everybody within the bed. And so you can, and then the last sentence, you can imagine how much money hospitals save by releasing a patient almost a day earlier on average. I would like to, to respond to that. I feel like this is there's two two aspects to this question. I'm I'm curious on the one end, once a patient is in the hospital, how can we save? On the other end of the question is how can we get a patient to not go into the hospital? So how do we what do what can we do to keep that from happening that they don't even need to be in a hospital? And so when we talk about, and I appreciate Chris's um, really really important point about measuring. Uh, the determinants of health, right? There is no, we're looking, we're always looking for this causal factor of, you know, if you increase education, then you're going to have decrease of diabetes. I mean, it's hard to, to do that. I mean, what we do is we try to find where is it working? I talked about a lot of challenges that are going on in the Delta, but there are pockets of the Delta that are healthy, that are successful. And so we try to understand why they're healthy, why it's successful, what's in that place. Um, you know, the first step is try to, not that it's right, what can we replicate? What can we learn? Uh, but you can't do that without really understanding these currents, I believe that Chris is talking about fully. Um, and then hospitals also are thinking differently now. There's an article that just came out in Health Affairs where health administrators are, are seeing that if you wanna invest in your community, right? We, hospitals get paid through Medicaid, Medicare, private insurances, and that's how they do it. They get the hospitals, and I'm a healthcare provider, I'm a physician, we get paid by the, the care that we provide. But hospitals are realizing that they need to invest in their communities in the ways that we're talking about right now to keep from people coming into the hospitals. The problem is that it's hard to pay for that. It's hard to tell Medicare and Medicaid, help me to keep someone out of the hospital and then keep them in. And so we have to incentivize health uh, care entities to start thinking differently about the way they look about health in their communities. Yeah, should I maybe seek a, a contribution here from Simone? And I think we still have this pending question in the air. Where, where do we start with health as designers? What is maybe uh, our kind of uh, first step in that? And, and here's experience in, in those really um, uh, disaster-driven communities, uh, and maybe there's an, an input from your side, Simone? Well, uh, in, wanna... in my point of view, that is a point of view of an architect, of a designer, it's uh, uh, what, is, what is the role of architects of this, or uh, designers? Do, do they really have a role in uh, the design process? I, I say yes, because 
um, well, the starting point is that uh, uh, healthcare is a basic human right and uh, it has to be easily accessible, it has to be free in charge for everybody everywhere. Um, when we have started to work, uh, the first hospital we have designed more than 15 years ago in Sudan, uh, we, we were asked by the founder of this uh, NGO, Italian NGO, to, to work on this project. And uh, he said, are you available? He said, yes, but uh, we have to be sincere. We have not we have, uh, and we have no experience about uh, designing hospitals. So this would be the first time. Say so, yes, that's perfect. Um, because uh, you don't have to look on the, the, the handbooks. Uh, you have to look at the places, you have to look at the people, you have to look at the rights. Uh, I think this, this was, a, 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 all, I, all I want from you is that uh, this hospital has to be scandalously uh, beautiful. And uh, uh, we didn't really understand the, uh, that quote, but uh, we understand it a little bit later. Uh, where is the scandal? The scandal is uh, uh, bringing rights everywhere to everybody. And so I think also, uh, also beauty is a right. So, but in, in my point of view, beauty is uh, uh, translated in terms of uh, appropriateness, in terms of giving response to a necessity. Um, there is a uh, very nice quote of uh, Giancarlo De Carlo, who's a master, uh, master, Italian master architect. And he says that the beauty is uh, uh, the purpose of design. But what is really important is the process that brings you to produce a, a beauty. And uh, so um, we can read the beauty in terms of uh, uh, necessity. And uh, um, it is our responsibility to give answers to this basic necessity. Thank you, Simone, um, for the... Um, uh, input. Let's look at if we have uh, maybe one more question. I know we are we are just at time here right now. Um, we have one more question here from Bilal Mishani. A question to Dr. Stach here, and in particular emphasizes um, yeah the question of course the smart cities and if uh, he can expect or had already experience any pushback or criticism regarding the cybersecurity risk. So that's certainly um, a big question here because as we know from his presentation, um, data um, and of course uh, big data and, and, and machine learning is of course the tool that we're all expecting will support us in this kind of understanding of communities and, and, and the uh, problematics. So is there maybe any questions concerning cybersecurity? Well, you know, if, if you really look at the entire ecosystem, what defines a smart city? Actually, a lot of the things are pretty hands-on and down to earth, like, you know, equal distribution of healthcare facilities and, you know, access to food and, you know, green infrastructure and, and all these things, which for sure there is some data necessary to make uh, informed decisions, but I think that part can be done pretty analog. There are other aspects where maybe cybersecurity becomes more important. Let's say the interaction between you know, people and buildings or buildings and buildings. You know, if you look at Google home automation systems, so they, they really know exactly where you are in your apartment and when you're at home and uh, when you're abroad and these kind of things. Then for sure, I think cybersecurity becomes um, definitely more important. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, we are already connected with so many devices to the World Wide Web where um, I think we're just adding more layers to this. So we have to certainly tackle the cybersecurity threat, but I don't think that's a hurdle to become a smarter and a more inclusive society. Maybe related, um, maybe uh, one more contribution here from some uh, Simone Friso on, on their kind of, uh, I would say, approach to, to projects. And I wanted to know from him, um, what role data plays, um, particularly in, in, in those maybe more uh, foreign places. And we know that in the US, for example, a lot of the federal data related to population health, et cetera, now particularly with COVID, it was very readily available. 
So it was um, even for our students in the class, it was possible for them to access um, uh, data banks and uh, and try to get insights. Mm -hmm. And I think the difficulty certainly is now we have here an architect or an, uh, a team of architects working in places that are um, maybe more difficult to access. Maybe there's even issues politically to get data from those places. Maybe they have all cybersecurity and safety issues. They don't want to really release any data. So is there any experience from you, Simeon, Simone? How do you go about something like that? Well, uh, well, it's a difficult question. Well, uh, architecture, um, architectural design is a very long process. You, when you start to design a, a hospital or any kind of part, any kind of building, uh, it takes uh, months, uh, sometimes years, to, to see uh, your project uh, realized. What is really important for me is to, to spend time in the place and to work with uh, uh, many kinds of professionals, uh, multidisciplinary. Uh, teams uh, are fundamental for us. We have worked with uh, sociologists, uh, with anthropologists. Uh, this is what is important is to 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 to, to really understand uh, um, the political context, the physical context, the social context. Um, the genius logi, as we we say in Italy. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, and this is a lesson of uh, uh, Charles Correa, a great uh, Indian uh, master architect, uh, when, he, when he said to us uh, a few years ago, before he passed, uh, uh, what is important is always to bring something new. It has to be connected with the places, but it has to be something of new. Because bringing something of, uh, new is, uh, uh, is a sort of message. You are, uh, when you bring something new, uh, you are taking care of a place, you are taking care of uh, the people, you are taking care of uh, individuals and uh, of the communities. So again, um, architecture is definitely a political act. Okay, good. So um, we are, um, yeah really at, at closing time right now. And I think it's um, a good moment to um, reflect on what we heard. And uh, I would say thank you very much for our panelists here um, and in, in joining us in this kind of afternoon session here in Venice, Italy, in the middle of the Biennale uh, di Architettura in Venice. And I hope that uh, you all had the possibility to hear our audio from you um, fairly clearly. Um, it's, um, you know, excuse if we had some background noise here, but we tried very hard to get um, some kind of um, tampering of the noise of all the videos around us and installations. So um, yeah, I think reflecting back, um, I think we, we understood all that uh, we need to talk more to each other. We need to... Um, share our experiences, our knowledge, um, we, as we are all experts. And it looks to me that the question of health and design is, an, is a very important one. Um, it has certainly been around us before COVID and has been certainly exacerbated by the conditions we all experienced. And I hope that um, in the near future, um, we have more and more of those possibilities of discussing the topic and, and widening a bit our, our audience and getting, um, you know, um, the whole movement uh, forward. And in that sense, uh, from my part, uh, I want to invite maybe Chris, uh, who is over there lonely in the United Kingdom, my co-host, to speak a few words um, as we close. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I echo what you said. Thanks to all the, all the panelists. Uh, wonderful to hear your presentations. So thanks everyone for attending. And uh, I'd, my, my sort of final thought is uh, perhaps the a bit of polemic is uh, working in the, with the NHS here in the UK and some organisations. This thrust to get uh, services out into patients' homes and the question of the future hospital. I think we're going to see a kind of push towards, largely that's driven by COVID and the necessities of managing risk. But we're going to see this ongoing push towards sort of decentralised, distributed, remote to virtual healthcare. So where only the most complex, those with without digital access are seen in physical spaces. And so the future of kind of walls within healthcare as such, I think is, is uh, gonna change rapidly in the next 10 years. But having said that, I think there's a need for new spaces that 
uh, of, afford people new experiences uh, to enhance their mental health. I'm thinking in particular, there's a new mental health hospital in the capital of Greenland, uh, Nuke. That's a wonderful, fantastic design, uh, really addressing the mental health problems of people living in, in a highly seasonal, uh, dark six, seven months of the year uh, place such as that capital of Greenland. So I think we perhaps have to make a distinction between mental health and physical health, physical health going outside and distributed, and mental health affording new spaces for people to connect, to interact in different ways, and to be supported in, in, in their mental illness or the negative affects of their experience. And so that kind of distinction, I think, is, is important to, to bear sort of going forward. And when we think about the task of transdisciplinary urban design and health, uh, I think an increased understanding of the of mental aspects of, of illness and mental illness uh, will come into play more increasingly. So, um, so anyway, so um, that was my perspective. Again, thank you, everybody, and uh, I leave you to wrap up, Christian, and yes, someone else to shut okay. everything down. I guess. <laughs> yes. Would well, have been a pleasure have to have you here. So uh, thank you every, everyone for uh, um, attending and uh, listening into our conversation. And yeah, hopefully in the next uh, near future, we talk again about health and design. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you uh, also to Brooke over in Arkansas for uh, your participation, to um, Edgar Stach and to Simone Esfrizo. Thank you everybody. And also to the technical staff for supporting us. Uh, thank you very much. And bye everybody from Venice, Italy. Thank <laughs> you.